The following is a special presentation of the Dustin Geek Podcast. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast with Chris Senzak and Aaron Cameron. You know, there's a lot of news sites that'll tell you there's a pandemic on the loose and there's riots in the streets and the hurricanes are coming and the murder hornets are here, but if you want to get the important news... And you've come to the right place. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast. I, today, will be playing Anchor. And my co-anchor, together, we are... <laughs> this is Chris Sinzak. <laughs> so professional. Yeah, I tried, man. I tried. That's why we could never have a real news show. But, I mean, this <laughs> is the important stuff, right? Well, at least to us, so like I, yeah. If you watch the regular news, you know what you're going to get force fed. So I, I think we're, I think we're covering the, the more entertaining part of news to yeah. us. Yeah, if you're going to get force fed news, then rely on this stuff because at least it's fun and entertaining, and it's stuff that you know it, it's important stuff. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, we've uh, we haven't done a new noise episode since March 9th. That's that's the last time we did one. Yeah, and you know what? We haven't covered anything in the last month because we've been celebrating Christmas in July. So we've got a whole month's worth of news to catch up on. And so great, perfect timing. It's new noise. And some stuff is KISS related because we can't really leave it alone with some of the stuff we learned this last week. Yeah, speaking of which, you know, I want to say maybe this week we forgo the reviews and look at a couple of comments that we got because man last week's episode was pretty cool you know when i listened back to it on the edit i really enjoyed it because it was a snapshot into our lives as little kids of where we came on to kiss and where we grew along with kiss you know and i think that struck a chord with a lot of people just like i knew it would because there's so many other people out there in our circle that have also experienced a lot of these same things and and maybe not even in the same timeline, but still totally can understand where each other are coming from because we're all a part of the KISS timeline. And we got so many great comments on the Facebook page and even on the YouTube. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we did a couple little snapshot from the YouTube and a couple of comments that stuck out to us on, on Facebook. But yeah, thanks so much. We love getting feedback from you guys. So like that means more to us than anything. We love that you download. We love that you listen. But uh, to get it, get feedback from you means a lot to us because it's nice to hear what you guys yeah, think. Yeah, for sure. You know, we we started the community, so we get to hear all the cool stories too. Damn it. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, here's a couple. You know, Rock and Ron. He's been on the case during the quarantine sessions and all the way leading up into Christmas in July, and now coming into into August. You know, and he's right on the case over at YouTube on Decibel Geek TV, and he uploaded last week's episode, and we got some cool comments over there. Metalcore said, I love Decibel Geek, I love Kiss Music, and all their albums. <laughs> Works for me. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's see. I'll, wait, you read this one. This one looks like it's kind of like your name. You should have a bit easier time pronouncing it, I think. Oh, put me on the spot, why don't you? Um, <laughs> Use your Polish powers and pronounce this name, please. Polish powers. Yeah, superhero. Um, yeah, this comes from Steven Zalipski. He Very says, nice. uh, New Year's Eve 1987, Crazy Nights Tour, Hera Arena, Dayton, Ohio, front row. Damn good time, open with Love Gun. See, Thanks, that's so cool because everybody has their moments, you know, just like we did, just like we talked about last week. Indy Colt on the YouTube comments says, great episode, fellas. Love the old episodes as well. Keep up the good work. So, man, very cool stuff coming to us. And thanks again to Rock and Ron Runyon, our good friend. Man, if you guys missed that episode in the quarantine sessions, <laughs> Oh, I don't know boy. what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, we got to give props to Rock and Ron because, like, you know, since, uh, around the time that we started the quarantine sessions, we kind of we kind of made an executive decision to, to like start putting because like our shows are a lot more they're less uh, we're, they're less likely to get copyright strikes because we've kind of made some changes. So yeah. 
Um, and YouTube is a whole audience that we don't really – we've kind of dipped our toe in where Rock and Ron's done some amazing special episodes um, for video versions. But uh, I was just like, just going forward, he's been putting up every episode that we've been doing the same week that it comes out. So trying to kind of capture that audience too. So if YouTube's your thing, you can usually within two days, the, the new episode is up on there. So make sure you subscribe on there too and leave some comments on there because we, uh, we love hearing from you. Yeah, it's the only good thing about the uh, whole pandemic is that now Rock and Ron has no concerts to go to. He doesn't have any awesome footage to go capture for Decibel Geek TV. He's got nothing to do. So the benefit is ours over on Decibel Geek TV. Yeah, so yeah, Rock and Ron can't get snubbed by Stephen Piercy, so he has to work on our stuff. <laughs> we'll never snub you, Ron. That's right. We got some more comments here from Facebook. Uh, here's one from Herb Brown. He said, I just listened to your podcast number 416. Man, I, sometimes I forget how high we're climbing here on those. Raised yeah. on Kiss, great show. This is the first time I've heard you. I'm older than you guys and got into Kiss at the perfect time. Destroyer. I heard Peter Chris sing Beth and my life changed. That album was packed with so many great songs. However, growing up, my parents wouldn't let me go to their concerts because I was too young. So my first concert was 1984 when I was a senior in high school. No makeup. So when the reunion was announced, they weren't playing in Omaha. So I got tickets for Kansas City Kemper Arena. Obstructed view. Didn't matter. I finally got to see my boys together again. Love them to this day. But like you guys, I disagree with them about certain things. But we finally got them into the Hall of Fame, and it took long enough. That's a good wow. one from Herb Brown. I like that. I'll always love hearing from new people that just now have discovered the show. That's a trip, um, man. Hey, Herb, check out the archives, baby. There's all kinds of stuff for a KISS fan. Yeah, and props to you for seeing them in Kansas City at Kemper Arena. I saw a lot of great shows when I lived up there. Um and I, I love the, the mention of obstructed view. Do you remember in Tom Morello's um, induction speech at the Hall of Fame where he was he, his first Kiss concert? I don't remember what tour it was, but he was saying he got uh, he got tickets and they said a partial it said partial view. Oh, and no. he was like, he's like, oh, it, it's a partial view of Kiss. So I'm going to like learn something new about them, like inside there. And he's like, then I realized really fast that I was just sitting behind a pole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That sucks. <laughs> oh, well, it didn't deter uh, Herb there. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we got. Ray Kersinger says, in grade school, the boys and girls liked Kiss, 1979. In high school, I was mocked by fellow students, but I endured the ridicule. I always stood up for them and by them. In the 70s, I was forever trying to match pieces of half-covered, no-makeup, face shots to get full pictures of the baddest mofos in rock once i seriously had an, an ingenious plan to remove makeup from my gene simmons action figure not doll the plan fell through and my gene had a peach colored nose that's as far as i got i was gonna be the first person to unmask a kiss doll uh i mean action figure <laughs> I love that. <laughs> See, but I could totally relate to stuff like that. Yeah. You That's had to get awesome. very industrious back then to try to figure out what they looked like. Well, <laughs> so. and then, like I said, that reminds me of like taking the, the uh, double platinum album, opening it up, putting a piece of paper over the top of it, and trying to shade lightly with a crayon or with the side of a pencil or something. Yeah. Well, it was like we always get – anytime we've had people on the show that – that were around in the seventies and knew them, you know, off stage. It's like, it, even to this day, even though we all know what they look like, it's still kind of mystical to imagine, wow, you saw kiss in 1975 and they didn't have makeup. It just still blows me away. You know, yeah, just the same way. Like when pictures are released, like new found stuff, it comes up every so often, you know, with a yeah. lot of different bands, but with kiss, when a picture comes up that you'd never seen before, but it's them like hanging out backstage or my favorite ones are like where they're wearing the costumes, but don't have the makeup on, you know, those are right. so badass, And it's just something, I guess you just have to be a kiss fan to get it. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff's gold for me. I remember like the, some of the first, uh, well, Kiss, the history book had some photos of them unmasked in the seventies. And then the, even before that, I think, yeah, before that, um, the kiss my ass home video. Remember that where, uh, 
you know, Paul is talking, showing pictures of him and Ace with beer steins wearing, oh, yeah. you know, not wearing makeup. Yep. You know, I remember that was just blow. That blew me away at the yeah. time. So cool. All right, one more. Darren Hunt, he says, great episode. You talked about the Nashville show being the day after the show where the drum tech filled in for Pete. Well, I know a tribute band drummer who they had come in. He was backstage in full makeup and costume, just waiting to see if Pete was going to do it. As we all know, he did. He said it was still a great experience, and they treated him great. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and that that kind of surprised me because um, I'd never heard anything about that before. And I went ahead on the comments and I said, I asked, him, was it Steve Clark? Because Steve Clark was a, I want to say he was in Larger Than Life. Maybe it was a different tribute band, but he's kind of like known as the Peter Chris tribute drummer next to Andrew Scambatti, of course. Yeah. Um, and and Darren confirmed that it was. So oh, wow. honestly, that's a story that I don't think is out there in Kiss land. So. That might be something we look into because that could be a because like I didn't know they had somebody waiting in the wings at the Nashville show, so that's interesting. There you go, write it on the calendar for July of 2021. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve, did you do this? Yeah, we'll come back in a year and talk to us about it. <laughs> Don't do any other podcast until 2021 in July, right. and we'll be waiting on you. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks to everybody that leaves us reviews, recommendations, or just comments. You know, like like Chris said, you know, that's so cool to us to be able to see that, you know, we're doing our part to round up all the rock and rollers, get them all together, and get talking about rock and roll again because it's still important to us. It's never gone away, and it's still as good as it's ever been. And you know what? We're glad to be a part of it. So we keep the Decibel Geek rolling. Here we are, 400-some episodes. Wow, getting up to 500 pretty quick. Not bad. But we've always got people to thank because these are the people that help us out the most. And these people are the ones that got out and shared last week's episode, raised on Kiss. They shared it on Facebook. They shared it on the Twitter. However all that stuff works, I don't know. All I know is that they're Geeks of the Week. Yeah, Geeks of the Week this week are Derek Laba, Joseph Capone, Rock and Ron Runyon, Decibel Geek TV, The Bakery Podcast, Aaron Baker, Mike Parnell, Kevin Williams, David Glenn, Mikhail Burrell, Keith Rockford, Todd Cunningham, Sean Cullen, Shay Hargett. Happy birthday, by the way, Shay. Saw that recently. Mark Alden Taylor, Freeform Rock Podcast, Andrew Jacobs, Jeff Taylor, In Obscuria Podcast, Eladio, Jared Norlander, Doug, Alan Deshaun, Paul Kane, Stick Stickman, Vet Halen, Gerardo. Pichirallo, Chris, Chris Vickery, Brad Kalmanson, and as always, the, the Mover Fooder. That's Fooder. right. Those are our people. They shared, retweeted. I told you all about it before. That's how you become a Geek of the Week. If you want to become one of these prestigiously awesome people, all you got to do is the same with this week's episode, New Noise, right here on the Decibel Geek Podcast. Do it. Very cool. All right. So... How do we start the new noise, huh? What's the most important thing that's happened in the last month while we were in Kistery Land? Um, has to be Ace Fraley news, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, we have a couple of stories, good and bad, to talk about with Ace Fraley this week. Well, let's start with the good, man. The good news is Origins Volume Two is complete, and we're going to be getting it this year. Yep, it's um. I'm excited for this. I I overall like the track listing. We'll go over that in a second. Um, and he released a, a, a first single from it. What'd you think of that, man? Deep Purple Space Truck. And I mean, it's it's a perfect Ace cover, right? If he does songs about space, this is one that you can check off the list. The first uh, the first single, of course, I like the vocals better than the original, but that's my personal taste. You know what? When it comes to Ian Gillen, I'll actually agree with you on this one. Yeah, I think his vocals sound better on this than they have on any of the last couple of records. I, and that may be because they buried his vocals a little bit more in the mix. But that's always been a complaint over the last couple of records, especially on Origins 1. His vocals were too far out in front. And this time they're a little bit more subdued, which actually works to his favor. He sounds more like 70s Ace on this song than a lot of the re- more recent stuff. Nice. I like that, man. I was excited the day that came out. Space Ace Trucking gotta love it man what let's go through the rest of the track list what's all going to be on there so uh, the it's the first song is good times bad times by zeppelin um i could kind of take or leave that pick i mean i love that he did um bring it on home yes yeah i love that but he didn't uh, sing the vocals on that one 
No, um, Scott Coogan, the drummer at the time, did. And I don't um, think he'll probably sing the vocals on this Zeppelin tune either. I wouldn't think so. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I mean, does I've it, heard enough Zeppelin. Does it the last say on your life. list who the guest people are on it? On this, because he's always got uh, cool guests on his Origins album. I guess the last one sure had a bunch of them. Yeah, Slash I'm looking through the five and all that. Paul Stanley, even. Yeah, they mentioned some of the guests on here, but I don't see anything for. I think I seen that Lita Ford is doing a song on there with him. I th- she's doing um, Jumpin' Jack Flash, I believe. Yeah, dang it! See, that's the one I'm at. The one that I'm excited for is uh, Robin Zander doing 30 Days in the Hole. See, that should be pretty cool. With Ace Frehley playing guitar on an old Humble Pie tune? Hell yes. Yeah. And uh, Bruce Kulick's going to guest on uh, Manic Depression. That's pretty cool, man. Who would have ever thought that in 2020 that Ace Frehley and Bruce Kulick will be on an album together? You know, especially growing up in the era that we did where right. there was so much of a rivalry between those two bands that if you'd asked me in 1989, do you think Ace Frehley and Bruce Kulick will ever play on a song together? I'd be like, are you out of your mind? That's never going to happen. Right. Yeah, I, I'm excited for, to hear what that sounds like because <clears throat> I know Bruce is a giant Hendrix fan also. Yeah. So that'll be cool. I don't, and like John Five's guesting on it, but he's doing two of the songs I'm not really that excited about. He's doing The Beatles' I'm Down and Cream's Politician. They're okay songs, but I don't know. I would have picked something else. Eh, they're a little bit different. I mean, if you're going to do a Beatles song, it's not like one that everybody does, you know, and that was kind of some of the complaint about origins volume one was you know white room street fighting man you know uh especially wild thing and magic carpet ride those two are the two worst songs on the album it's got a lot to do with the fact that you've heard them a million times and everybody covers those songs so if he's going to pick a beatles tune to do i think i'm down's a good one for him i want to i want to hear him do hey bulldog See, that would be badass. I know Alice Cooper did a really cool cover of that on yep. that one of them old uh, Bob Kulick tribute albums. Yeah, and then also um, he's doing Never In My Life by Mountain. I love that song. Wow, that should be cool. See, there you go. You uh, suggested him to do a mountain cover, and he did it. Yeah, I wanted to see. I want to hear him do a theme from an imaginary Western just because that's like the inspiration for Going Blind. I think that would have been a cool Kiss tie-in. Yeah. Yeah, and he's he's covering She on this record, which is interesting. Really? With himself on yeah. vocals, I bet. That should be cool. Right. But, I yeah. was, you know, I thought if you were going to do that, why, why not do it with Strange Ways, you know? I don't know. Like, you know, he's, he's picked She, which was really technically a Wicked Lester song. And then, you know, the last record he did, um, Rock, Rock and Roll, Roll Hell, Hell, which yeah. wasn't a song he played on either. That's what I liked about Rock and Roll Hell was that was kind of like, what would this song have been like if Ace was still in Kiss right. when Creatures of the Night came out? If Ace played on that album, I would like to hear him do more songs off that album. Maybe do something off of Lick It Up. What, <laughs> yeah, what, I don't know if, yeah, what would a song off Lick It Up sound like if Ace played on it? I don't know. I, I wouldn't change a thing about Lick It Up, though. I think I'd keep it the way it was. I'd hear Ace do a cover of uh, Murder in High Heels. <laughs> That's Animal Eyes. Oh. Why not? Well, it, could, it couldn't be any worse, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm mean, interested to hear the rest of it. You know, I mean, I'm obviously also looking forward to the next Originals album. I don't know. You know, like a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of naysayers. Ah, you know, Space Man and Space Invader were just not all that good. But I don't know. I to fuck I'll they weren't. It. They were awesome, both of them. I didn't. Well, Spaceman was a step down. I thought overall, I, Space I, I, Invader like, was. I mean, pretty great. You know, Space that Invader was, that was, was hard was, to top. Space Invader was a good, complete record. Um, Space Man had moments. Like I thought, Mission to Mars is an amazing yeah. song. But uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll even if it's even if it's like a, a half and half good bad record, I'll take it over nothing. You know, I mean, like at least he's giving us material. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about that the other day. How since like. 2015 ace freely has been so proficient with music and as an ace freely fan you're not really used to that you know <laughs> i know he's out working paul and gene in that respect yeah that's badass i love it yeah but uh the, yeah so i mean that's interesting i and i love space truck and i've gone back and listened a few times i like the organ solo on it you know it's a nice tip of the hat to john lord so the video you know, is I, awesome it's got the dudes from the rock and roll residency in it oh yeah and um 
I talked to Philip, and apparently they they are on one of these songs on yes. the tri- on Origins too, but they won't tell me who what song it is. I so saw that too. Yeah, on. I'm glad they're playing on something though. That's cool. Yeah, so that's cool. But yeah, that, yeah, Origins too coming your way. But uh, we're off to a promising start so far. You know what? And speaking of that, here's something I had on my list for new noise. So I'll just slide it on in there before we get to the next part of the Ace Fraley story. Is that the rock and roll residency that you guys know pretty much as the guys as Gene Simmons Band and Ace Fraley's Band have come out with their own EP, self titled "The Rock and Roll Residency." And mm-hmm. I know Chris, you've heard it. I've heard it. It's freaking awesome. Yeah, it was definitely a, a worthwhile purchase. So that's something we're going to play. That'll be our rolling out of here song at the end. We're going to play oh, something cool. by The Rock and Roll Residency for you. And we want you guys to go check out that EP because you know what? Those guys are part of history. If you don't have it, you're missing something from your Kiss collection. So make sure you get those songs. Yeah, and they did a um, – did you watch the live stream the other night? No, I missed it, damn it. Oh, you can watch the replay. Oh, but nice, yeah, it was really? um it was great. I watched that. I watched the whole thing. It was like 90 minutes long. It was amazing. That's cool. We'll have to put the links for this stuff in the episode show notes. Yeah, definitely. It was a it was a great set. And they they even played some of the stuff off the new record too. Sweet. Yep. So, okay, so we're uh, we're there's two stories that we have today that i would classify in the batshit crazy section and this is the first one okay yeah this is definitely pretty crazy you sent me this and i was blown away by it so all right so where do we start aaron (laughs) oh man well you know ace fraley for a long time was dating this woman named rachel gordon and you know they what how long like four years something like that five to seven (laughs) maybe i don't know it's been a while but uh, news came out, I guess, earlier in the year that they had split up. And then Ace had, I don't know how, it seemed like he showed up, grabbed a bunch of stuff, and hit the road. you know. But it was all his stuff. But in the right. process of being in a hurry of grabbing things and getting the hell out of there, he left a bunch of really cool stuff behind. Yeah. And so this past week, um, a website called ladyspaceandace.com got launched and it's from rachel and it's on the description page says memorabilia items were collected over the years while ace fraley and rachel gordon were married technically they were not married he's still married to Jeanette, so that's a lie um they are now being presented for the first time for sale on the internet for your viewing many of the items for sale include platinum records real or real tapes of kiss music sessions aces clothing and jewelry personal photos and much more man i took a scroll through some of that stuff I'm really interested mostly in the reel-to-reel tapes, but really mostly into that cassette collection he's got. And I'm not talking about he's got an awesome cassette collection. He's got some weird-ass old dubbed cassette tapes of all kinds of weird stuff. That's the thing. It's like a lot of this stuff, I mean, seeing it, it's as a Kiss fan, for you and me, obviously it's cool to see that this stuff exists. Yeah. But... At the same time, this girl is just straight up asking for a lawsuit right now because this is this is not her property. And I think, and you know, with what we know about Ace, more than likely he was just like, ah, it's a bunch of old junk, so I'll leave it there. And then that's the saddest part is I don't know that Ace values the stuff like we do. No, of course not. There's been numerous stories about that over the years where you know something that he would throw away, you'd be like. <clears throat> You know, oh, no, no. Yeah, so it's it's like, it, but it, it kind of disgusts me because, you know, it, regardless of what happened with their relationship, because she's also making a lot of horrific claims right now about her and Gene Simmons. Yeah, that's um, that's the even craziest part, because she had said something about she had been raped by Gene Simmons and all, yeah. I mean, went that far with it. Yeah, she's like... She's begging for a lawsuit. Um, I don't know if it's true. Then you know, if that, if that's if it's true and that's the case, then oh my god. Yeah, no, that's um, the crazy thing because you don't know what's true or not. What you see here is this chick is she's selling her ex boyfriend's stuff that she knows is valuable, but it's really not hers to sell. You know, and I'm sure somebody's got to see this and go, you know, hey, she's going to make a ton of cash off this stuff because. Okay. 
these are one of a kind items. You know, you don't realize that cruddy old box, a shoebox full of cassette tapes is actually pretty priceless to the right people. Yeah, for sure. I would yeah, love the, just to, you know, I'm going to email her and say, hey, can I just, you know, come over with my old cassette player for a while? <laughs> Check some of this stuff out. Yeah, there's, it's like, let me get out, of, let me get this out of the way first. I think it's, it's despicable that she's trying to sell this stuff because it's not her, it's not rightfully not her property. Um, but at the same time, some of these tapes, they posted pictures of the tapes and there's some really interesting stuff in here. Um like one that stuck out to me was a tape that says Sean singing Rocket Ride. So this is basically the Rocket Ride demo with Sean Delaney singing the vocal. Wow. Um, there's also a Kiss Savannah, Georgia, 1979 Dynasty tour show on tape. Yeah. Um, there's one thing, two new untitled songs by Eric Carr for Ace. Yeah, I saw that. I'm looking through it now. There's a lot of interesting stuff on here. There's like, there's one that's just called Kiss Practice. Who knows what year that's from? Um, there's a copy of The Elder on here, so I guess maybe Ace didn't throw it out of his car when he heard it. Um, <laughs> he was so drunk, it bounced off the mirror and landed in the back seat. Right. There's also um, a Kiss Dynasty show from Atlanta on tape. Wow. Which I don't, I don't know if these shows are av- – I don't collect a lot of audio Kiss stuff. I used to, but not so much anymore, so I don't know if that's actually like commonly traded or not. But I know a guy named um, Gary Cap. that's kind of a historian on that stuff of what's you know audio-wise what's available out there. I wonder if that's on his list. Yeah, there, but there's also some weird stuff in here from Gene. Like there's – there's one that it's called Love Came to Me. It says Simmons on it, and like that's a, that's on the Gene Simmons um, vault thing. That's an old Kiss demo from Gene, but it's like I think that's after Gene was. That's after Ace was in the band. There's some there's so stuff from why, Gene in here. Yeah, so from why the would 80s. Ace have something like that? Yeah, it's like so. It's like how did Ace get a hold? I don't know how Ace got a hold of some of these things. Like there was some. I think It's My Life was on one of the tapes, but then somebody helped explain that online where you know Ace guessed it on. Wendy O. Williams album. So Right, but not that, that song. No, I think he does play on that song. I thought he played on Bump and Grind only. No, I think he, well, he at least demoed um It's My Life. Gotcha. Yeah. But then there's a tape here. There's Secretly Cruel, Hello, Hello, So Many Girls, So Little Time. That's what those are asylum demos. Right. So, so I don't know. I, Secretly I don't get cruel, how Ace that, said that. That means one of two things then. Either that song's been around for a long time or how the hell did Ace get himself a, a Gene Simmons tape of songs that he was thinking about using maybe for Asylum? Yeah, I guess that's possible because like Gene and Paul would also sell other people their songs. So that that maybe that's the explanation for it. Yeah, maybe but, Ace, yeah. you know, give me some help here. Yeah, and there's a uh, Eric Carr live from the night. I don't know what that is. Toe in the line. Huh. I, there's. There's a lot of weird stuff in here. There's 80s stuff too. Then there's there's like three messages. There's two uh, two uh, tapes that are me- answering machine messages. I wonder what's on those. So basically, the bottom line here is if you're a rock and roll millionaire and you swoop in and buy all these things, you're a bad person unless you release it all on the YouTube for free so we can all hear it. Then you're cool. Well- <laughs> Well, and I mean, like, you know, with if it was Gene and Paul, I would probably be like, you know, this stuff might see the light of day officially, but with Ace, I don't have much confidence that he would ever release this stuff. See, and that's a shame, because if somebody would find these cassette tapes and go, holy shit, you know, is, is nobody close enough to Ace Frehley that's a fan enough to go, hey, man, you know, we ought to do something with these, we ought to listen to these, bring them in with a computer, see what we can pull off it digitally, you know, and save these things, because look what Gene Simmons just did with his vault. You know, you like to release the Origins albums, their cover albums, those are easy. You know what's mm-hmm. really easy? Compilation albums. And you know what compilation albums sell? Is when you're releasing stuff that you have a lot of fans, and they've never heard any of it. Right, you know? and so then at that point, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like the vault, that stuff wasn't pristine audio, like you'd expect out of a studio album. But you took it for what it was because they're old, weird songs that you've never heard before, and that's cool. You yeah. know, so if Ace has got this stuff, man, don't be silly. You got to release it. 
Make that oh, money. I'll buy it. Yeah, and here's the one that, that kind of interests me the most. It's a tape. It's Ace Demos, and you can tell that it's from the Dynasty era because Hard Time Save Your Love and 2000 Man is on here, which yeah. that's interesting alone. But there's two songs that no one's ever heard on here. One's called Insufficient Data, which I'm sure you got the idea from the Kiss Meets the Phantom movie. Oh, yeah. And then another one called Backstage Pass. So those are two Kiss songs wow. that, that no one's heard. That's the one I want. Yeah. I think that interests me the mo- more than anything else on here. To be a billionaire rock and roller, I could buy all this stuff. I'd just go to people's ex-wives and ex-girlfriends and be like, what do you got left over from your failed relationships? <laughs> I want to see the well, I wonder, There's another tape that it comes from 1981 when The Elder was being made. And it's funny because it's it's got a song called Silly Girl, which I don't know what that became. It's got another one called Every Little Bit of Your Heart, which that's what became A World Without Heroes, because that's common knowledge. Yeah, It's got It's My Life, and it's got Sentimental Fool, which I think that became something else. But then in the middle of it, it's got a track called Eric's Better Than Anton. Wow. <laughs> Some people think that that's uh, that's uh, Escape from the Island. Yeah, because it shows off the drumming. Huh, that's cool, man. But, and Ace um, would call it that. Yeah, but what I'm saying Anton's is, his I, friend. there's a lot of there's Kiss fans that have deep pockets that would probably make offers on this, but I don't know if they're going to because it's like it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. You could buy this and then it gets taken away from you. I don't know if it works that way. I mean, if you buy it, it's yours. It's not your responsibility anymore. It's the problem of the person that sold it. Well, tell that to the people that were displaying Kiss's costumes in Detroit in 1995 when Paul and Gene showed up and confiscated all that stuff. Eh, that'd be more like if you bought the stuff off of uh, this website. So you bought that weird Ace cassette, you know, and then you took it and you digitalized it and put it on CD and then started releasing it for sale. You're making a profit at that point. Right. But if you release it for free on the YouTube, like I'm asking you to, you could save 2020. Yeah, but whoever buys this is not going to do that. They're going to hoard it. Ah. I guarantee whoever buys it is not going to release it. I'm, I can almost guarantee that. If you had that kind of money and you could do it, would you release it? Or would I would, it? but that's why I'm not I a hoarder. Too. Yeah, you I know. would too. You could also buy Ace's Gucci shoes. I saw that. <laughs> I thought, damn, it's too bad Ace really doesn't wear his coolest shoes off stage. Yeah. Well, one thing that is actually. I would never actually, wear those. I think, let me make sure I got it right. But there was one thing that, uh, if I'm if I'm looking at it, oh, it's gone now, so it must have sold. Oh, wow. There, there was, um, well, wait, where is it? Oh, there it is. There's, I think, it, if I'm right, there's a silk shirt in here for sale, and it's the actual silk shirt that Ace wore at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Oh, wow. So that's... Uh, See, one-of-a-kind items. But, yeah. I mean, what do you do with something like that? You put it on a mannequin, and it's a purple yeah. shirt, you know? And people are supposed to go, well, what's up with the mannequin wearing the purple shirt in your office? Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> You don't think you would like get mad pussy for doing that? <laughs> I'll take off your pants, Curly. Yeah, that's Ace Frehley's shirt. Yeah, oh, okay. from his Hall of Fame induction <laughs> ceremony. <laughs> Glad you asked. And some big three hundred pound dude comes up. I'll blow you for that. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But the thing that bothered me the most about this was. It's not so much the tapes, because I honestly don't think Ace really cares much about the old music. I really don't, which is sad. But he should. And somebody close to him and his management team should know better than that. Oh, I agree, because it's a gold mine. But like, but also, what bothers me on a moral level is that there's a lot of personal photos from his childhood. Yeah, that, I forgot about here. that. Yeah, pictures and, of his mom and dad and stuff. And you're selling yeah. that to Kiss fans? That's not cool. Yeah, and I was like, I'm looking through the cassettes, you know, and I'm salivating, going, damn, I'd want to hear that. But then I get to the personal photos, and I'm looking at these photos of him from high school with his parents. And I'm like, man, it's just like, this feels dirty to look at. You know, just like, that's that's personal stuff. He, she shouldn't be selling that stuff. 
Well, then I guess the moral changes. The moral is now if you buy all this stuff, you can keep the Gucci shoes. You got to release all the audio free on the internet, but you got to give Ace Frehley his pictures back of his mom and dad for crying out loud. <laughs> it's, awful. It's, just, it, it's just so sad. And speaking of sad, let's move on to our next story. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. <laughs> Just when you thought we were out of Christmas in July, this rears its ugly head. What is this? I didn't even see this. What the hell is this? <laughs> this was um, this was uh, this is a screenshot of a thing that was sent to me from a listener of ours who is still in the good graces of the Vinnie Vincent fan groups. Oh boy, you want me Basically. to go ahead and read it? Well, let me just explain. And this wound up on Kiss FAQ too. I didn't put it on there because I usually just ignore this stuff. But this is so batshit crazy, I, I couldn't help but talk about it today. And it, the screenshot runs out, and it this message got changed. Um, he said the guy that told me the message got changed like three times, and they kept cutting stuff out. So what we're able to read today is more than what you could find there now if you were on there. Okay. All right. Well, this seems pretty far out. Okay. It's a uh, Vinnie Vincent official announcement to all Vinnie Vincent fans. All six of you. We have arrived at the crossroads of America's survival and our freedom as we witness the firestorm of communism sweeping through our country on the brink of civil war. Are you sure this is from a Vinnie Vincent website? It is. This seems like something else. All right, let me read on. This is from his handler. (laughs) In less than 100 days, we will know whether we preserved our freedom and the America we love or watch it vanish forever into darkness. Please don't tell me Vinnie Vincent's running for president. I'm going to withhold my comment. Go ahead. It is with this poignant historical setting that I have decided to bring us together for a very special event. On August 17th, 18th of 2020, Vinnie Vincent, Let Freedom Rock Bash, will take place at SIR Nashville. I am rescheduling the Vinnie Vincent Invasion Boys Are Gonna Rock concert, which was scheduled for August 8th and 9th, March 2021. (laughs) Wow. To allow for this special event to take place. That's just weird right there. Why why August 8th and 9th, I wonder? Hmm. Keep going. going. This documentary will be professionally filmed, edited, and released as a DVD set of these two very special days in October along with a backdrop of America's fight for life and liberty. (laughs) Vinnie Vincent performances will be filmed as they happen, along with the filmed collage of guest interactions of the selected invited fans who will be immortalized forever on a first-of-its-kind Vinnie Vincent DVD. This will be an intimate party where every guest will be captured on film. Their thoughts, opinions, voices, conversations, style, and excitement against a backdrop of our culture at this tumultuous moment in history. Wow. Wow. For a second there, I thought Vinnie Vincent was going to announce his presidency, his bid for the presidency. It's just more more batshit craziness from Vinnie Vincent. (laughs) But yeah, now this fucking idiot. He's well, like, he's, weird, he's wanting man. to. Now he's trying to like push a political theme on top of all this shit. And it's like, you know, and I love the fact that he talks about how. Uh, let me go. Let me find the place again. A firestorm of communism. Yeah, firestorm. He's like, yeah, he's a he's a big right winger apparently. Swinging um, through our country on brink of civil war. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, there is some crazy shit going on, no doubt about it. But I mean. I don't see what that has to do with Vinnie Vincent. I'm picturing Mike Pence getting the boot, and it's going to be a Trump Cusano 2020. <laughs> that'll be like that'll be like one of them articles. If Trump does this, it's Biden's election to lose. <laughs> well, uh, the, if he gets Vinnie Mike, Vincent as his running mate, yeah, Trump Cusano 2020. Oh my lord. 
But I, I like the the part where it goes um, a film collage of a film collage of guest interaction of the selected invited fans who will be immortalized forever on a first of its kind DVD. It's like, well, it's easy to film everybody when there's five people at the event. You know, there's there's going to be no problem with social distancing at, at his party. I'm sure. Boy, no, I guess not. <laughs> It's got I don't plexiglass know. Plexiglass on the other side of the salad. That's all. It's so it's so ridiculous, man. And like he, like you know, he, and you probably I didn't even tell you about this, but like he had he had the thing he had booked for August was a Vinnie Vincent Invasion concert, but he he hasn't announced he hadn't announced anybody that was going to play with him. And you know damn well that Mark and Mark and Dana alone would not do it. Uh, and then, and even if they did, it wouldn't be at a little tiny rehearsal space. Uh-oh. Mark will never work with him again, and Dana will never work with him again. Bobby's Bobby's his only shot at getting somebody from the invasion involved. Maybe Robert, but it just you know. know. So he was going to plan to do that. I just got a feeling like if the money was right, and you don't have to talk to him at all, no interaction. All he's doing is playing his guitar parts. That's all he's got to worry about. You don't even have to speak to him ever. He, you get off stage on this side, he gets off the stage on that side, and that's it. And the money was right, they'd do it. Yeah, but it doesn't work that way with Vinny. No, it sure don't, because he'd <laughs> he'd ruin the restraining order immediately. Well, yeah, because I mean, he's I don't know, he's a fucking loony, and like you know, and I and I hate I almost hate bringing this up, but it was so it was so over the top ridiculous that I was like, I have to talk about this. <laughs> wow. Well, there you have it. In less than 100 days, we will know whether we preserved our freedom in the America we love or we watch it vanish forever into darkness, according to Vinnie Vincent. Uh, I'm just going to listen to Motorhead. All right, so what's up next on the news desk? So this is something that we haven't been able to get to because we haven't done a new noise in so long, but it's kind of been the talk of the rock industry lately. And that's the feud between Chris Jericho and Sebastian Bach. Have you been following this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw some of that. So essentially, it boils down. I think Sebastian kind of fired the first shots where he where he talked about how singers that mime to a tape or, or use tapes as a supplement are are wrong, and Chris Jericho denies it, and then they like challenge the want they challenge each other to a sing off I'll sing in your face yeah <laughs> and uh and it's uh it's this is I hate to I hate to side with Sebastian on this but I'm going to have to well I mean because then Jericho which you know I'm a huge Jericho fan and I'm a huge Sebastian Bach fan Sebastian Bach don't like us I don't never understood why <laughs> but he don't you know so but still you know it's one of those things where even Chris Jericho said, you know, this this thing from Sebastian just kind of came out of nowhere. And Sebastian was somebody that Chris Jericho supported. You know, he openly was always a fan of Sebastian Bach, you know. And so I kind of can feel where Jericho's coming from in that because, you know what, we went through the same thing with Sebastian Bach. We never did anything but say good things about him. And for whatever reason, then it comes down to it. He hates her guts, and we don't know why. So, you know, well, yeah, we, we get it. I mean, we do, but it don't make sense. Yeah, well, he's the one person on planet Earth that doesn't like Michael Wagner. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it boiled down to basically Michael Wagner intimated, and that's a big word like gymnasium, that um, that it was that it was hard to work with Sebastian in the studio to record Skid Row. There's a lot more we could share on the show than what we did. Right, um, but we're but not going I think, to. But still, I think when he says that, what he meant was, you know, fuck, man, listen to Slave to the Grind. You know, what human being is going to, are you going to easily be able to pull those vocals out of? You know, you, you're much better off starting with a Sebastian Bach than you are me, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and like, Michael was always very complimentary of, of Sebastian. And yeah. like, anyone who... Anyone who was around at that time, I mean, Sebastian, he was the high watermark in those days. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was, his vocals, even if it took multiple takes to do vocal, and there's no shame in that. That's normal for recording rock records. And the other but, thing about Sebastian Bach, too, is, is, you know, vocally, he's aged pretty well. You know, he still sounds yeah. pretty damn good, considering the songs that he's trying to still sing. 
Oh yeah, and then like though he's he can't sing like nineteen ninety Sebastian anymore, but that's I mean that who's gonna hold that against him? But like Right. He's held up better him, than most. He, yeah, I mean we you and I went and saw him at uh the Mercy Lounge a couple of years ago and he was great. Yeah. You know, I mean yeah, there there was a little bit of echo added on to certain vocals and stuff that helped kinda gave him a little bit of uh assistance, but at the same but at the same time it was live vocals. I was I will just say that. Yeah, um, no doubt about it. But at the same time, him picking on Jericho is kind of also kind of pathetic, though, because it's like, you know, why do you have to pick on this guy? Because are you, I don't know. I just think Sebastian is bored at home personally. But um, it's a thing where he challenged he challenged Jericho, and and but this is the thing: if you watch footage of Fozzy, it looks obvious that he's using tapes. I mean, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem hard to figure out to me. Well, and see, that's the thing that I've always said about Jericho. Like, the first couple of albums are really great. But, like, the last album that came out and a lot of the stuff leading up to it, man, there's a lot of robotics on his vocals on those there's albums, of- you know. And I think I think that Chris Jericho's got a pretty damn good voice, and I like his voice clean, you know. Just like, same with Ozzy, you know. Ozzy's great. We all love Ozzy. But the Ozzy that most of us prefer is the stuff... That was before, like the robo vocals that we get nowadays. It, but it's one of those things where it's funny though because Jericho goes back and, and you know, and I feel I can feel kind of bad for Chris because I think Chris considered Sebastian a friend of his. Right, exactly. They're, they're both Canadian rock guys. So. Sure, and like he said, he always supported him. I I feel your pain, brother. <laughs> yeah, and Sebastian took shots at him. At the same time, I'm, it's one of those things where I can kind of see both sides of this because I. I do kind of agree with Sebastian where it's it's not cool to use tapes and stuff. I mean, if you want to be authentic, but Sebastian's also a massive hypocrite in this front because just a year or two ago, Sebastian was defending Paul Stanley going, he doesn't use tapes. He's really singing. It's like, give me a fucking break, Sebastian. Paul Stanley is definitely miming to tapes. So like, why is it okay for Paul, but not for Chris Jericho? I don't know. It's weird for sure. But for Chris Jericho, there's a highlight to it because along with us, You just made Sebastian Box a list. (laughs) You're in good company. But like Sebastian, I I respect the man's talent. He's a great performer. I love all the early Skid Row stuff. I love Angel Down. I even like Kicking and Screaming. Not as good as Angel Down. No, Angel Down is a freaking awesome album. Yeah, I mean, that album, pound for pound, stands up to the Skid Row stuff, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. But, um, But I don't know. He's just... He's still that overgrown 12 year old man. And like, it's like, you you know, we interviewed Rachel and Rachel kind of explained it to us. He's just like, would you want to work with that every day? And I honestly wouldn't. So like, you know, Rachel and Snake own all the, they own most of the publishing for those Skid Row stuff. So they can, they can make the money off the songs anyway, whether Sebastian's in the band or not. So it's like, yeah, we'd all like to see it happen, the reunion happen, but it's not going to, if those guys can make the lion's share of the money without dealing with him. Yeah, I wouldn't want to work with the guy either, but that'd be the same thing as like we were talking about with like the Vinnie Vincent invasion. You get off on that side of the stage, you get off on that side of the stage, you never speak to each other. But would he actually do it? He wouldn't. Probably Sebastian not. would fuck it up within two days. Yeah. You know he would. And like the thing with Chris the thing with Jericho though is in Jericho go, then Jericho does a a lot like a live stream where he does a recording where he's singing youth gone wild acapella did you see that i did see that you know what it, it and didn't sound that great but no. it sounded like chris jericho and it's him just freaking singing you know singing youth gone wild i mean yeah. grab grab your phone right now and record yourself without any background vocals singing youth gone wild and i'd love to see who sounds awesome you know <laughs> yeah but it didn't help his case at all <laughs> yeah, I was like, maybe That's not good not at all man it, 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 some- it helped his case in the fact that he did what he said he'd do you know and he had the balls to do it whether you know it sounded beautiful or not you know you got to give him that I'll give him that, but it didn't. It takes balls it, like to said, do something like that, and then release it when knowing you've got millions of followers. <laughs> I don't know. I man. love it. It's I like, like this Jericho. is a case where if, I, if I'm Sebastian, I'm like, really? That's your best shot? I mean, come <laughs> on. You know, but then like his bassist, so Sebastian's bassist, because a lot of people are thinking this is a work, but his bassist is like, too, no, yeah, it's not, it's not because, staged. Because Jericho's a wrestler, everybody assumes, oh, this is two buddies, you know, trying to work everybody, you know. (laughs) And I've heard a lot of friends of ours in the podcasting world say, oh, it's it's obviously a work. And I'm like, but it's not, though, because, 
you know, if if it's a work, then then Jericho on it alone is doing it to his own detriment. So it's like, you know, why would he agree to participate in a work that's claiming that he's doing fake vocals with Fozzie? Because that hurts Fozzie's business. Yeah, true. Yeah, if it points it out, yeah, that doesn't make sense. And, and also, and all- Jericho's a pretty busy guy. You know, he's got AEW wrestling and all that going on, so I doubt he's got time to fuck around with Sebastian Bach unneedfully. Yeah. But, you know, I guess when you get called out, sometimes you got to, you know, stand up and be like, okay, well, here it is. Well, it's, it's also not a work because Sebastian's not smart enough to play along with it. <laughs> He'd fuck it up somehow. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, it's... Man. it's- it's been funny to watch. It's like the modern day version of the uh, Axel versus Vince Neil argument. So you're going to be Team Sebastian on this. I'm going to go Team Jericho. If we're talking about vocal versus vocal against you know live versus pre recorded, I got to go with Sebastian. Oh well, I'm just sentimentally uh, siding with Jericho then because we're on the list with him. And he's definitely more relevant these days than Sebastian is. But I don't. Um, and plus, I want him to come to Rock and Pod next year. So Shit, yeah, that'd be uh, awesome. Uh, I want to stay on his good side, but um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's but you don't so, want so you don't want Sebastian Bach coming and making Rock and Pot all crazy. No, I don't. <laughs> He's not invited. Can I'll you imagine me having face. to deal with Sebastian Bach? <laughs> me having to deal with Sebastian Bach for three days? No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, you dodged a bullet with that a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, the equivalent. Wow, too funny. The list of Bach. <sighs> All right, I got some news. Check this out. I know you've been following this. I don't know if everybody else has been following this, but this is something really cool that you need to check out. Uh, The Tough Diaries just came out with number 16, and if you don't know about The Tough Diaries, this is a pretty cool look at the band Tough, which everybody knows I'm a big Tough fan. But beyond that, it's a really cool look at what it was like trying to be a band clawing you know your way trying to get to the top in that day and age it's it's really cool insight steve yourself is a freaking awesome writer and in number 16 you can learn what it's like to be served with a lawsuit while you're on stage what band hasn't gone through that right yeah no kidding and also he tells a story about how lita ford did not allow her a band she did not allow her band to hang out with tough and uh she ended up leaving the tour halfway through and that's some pretty interesting stuff but i'm a big fan of stevie rochelle's tough diaries you know and i'm like i said i'm pretty biased but even if i didn't like the band or didn't know nothing about the band this is a really good read oh yeah i've i check out all of those and he's always got great behind the scenes stories and i um I mean, Stevie, I will give Stevie credit. He does not mince words, and he shares everything, even if it's embarrassing to himself. Yeah, that's true. On this one, he talks about, you know, some of the tough times and how a lot of that might have been his fault. Not all of it, but, you know, he accepts accepts his part in it for sure. Those That were an interesting band, and, like, not to get off on a tangent, but, you know, they – it, they're one of the many bands that kind of came along like two years too late. So, you know, it, it's it's interesting to hear his perspective because he had to live through that stuff. Right, and, yeah. It's pretty You know, and thing. then like all the stuff with, uh, was it George, the guitar player, you know, like you know, massive drug problem. You know, it's it's uh, it's it, his diary. If you haven't checked it out, you know, like met, go to metalsludge.tv and check out the was it called the sludge dot was it called the tough diaries the tough diaries um it's really and like speaking of which why the fuck does stevie rochelle not start a podcast i don't know like he could be i don't maybe he just don't want to maybe he just enjoys writing with his stories and his contacts he could fucking own music podcasting if he wanted to well yeah all he'd have to do is call it metal sludge and it would probably be number one yeah, there's people on the Metal Sludge boards that have been begging him for years to start one. I don't get why he doesn't do it because it's not it's easy to, you know, record into a mic and put it out. But yeah. until then you have us. Right, yeah. We'll have to become like that Conrad Thompson and start our, our own thing where each of us have like five extra podcasts besides Decibel Geek where we host with all these famous people. Is that what he does? Shit, yeah. He's got all the wrestling guys. He's got Bruce Pritchard. He's got Jim Ross. He's got Eric Bischoff. He basically went out and found all the old-time guys in the different coolest parts of wrestling history that were entrenched the most deeply into it and started a podcast with all of them. Doesn't um, 
doesn't Hockey Talk Man have a show? Yeah, but I don't think it's a part of that. <laughs> no, it's not. Because he's it, like a famous might be, podcaster, uh, isn't he? I don't I don't know. I've never listened to the Honky Tonk Man's podcast. I gotta imagine he's got one. Maybe I'm confusing or he does live shows, I think. I know he does used to do a lot of them shoot interviews where he talks shit about people. <laughs> <laughs> talk about his career and all the people he wanted to talk shit about in between. I always love that character because he was like an asshole Elvis. It was great. Yeah, yeah pretty cool. <laughs> And there's nothing better than seeing a guy get a guitar broken over his head. That's right. <laughs> Honky Tonk Man's going to sing in your face, Sebastian Bach. Yeah. And then smash you with a guitar. <laughs> Here's another cool thing from the last month while we were in Kissmas in July. Enough's Enough had their new album come out, Brainwash Generation. I picked it up. I got it. This is cool, man. I never thought I would ever say this, but thank you, Walmart.com. I wanted to order the uh, new Enough's Enough. I was like, holy shit, it's coming out in a couple of days. i got to get on the case and get this thing ordered so I can get it at a you know reasonable time. And so I task the wife with it, and she finds it on Walmart.com. And I think, well, I've probably not a lot of swearing on the new Enough's Enough album, so I doubt I'm going to get like a censored version. Yeah, go ahead and get it. And I ended up getting it in the mailbox the day before everybody else through Walmart.com. Can you believe that? I guess Walmart's good for something. Yeah, that's it. That's the only thing that I'm aware of. What, what's we your just, review of we the almost, record? We almost had a sponsorship, and then we lost it for ourselves just in the same moment. Just there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the What do you think of the album? I dig it, man. I think it's pretty good. It's got some really good songs on it. Got you know, there's some kind of filler stuff on there too, a little bit. Um, you know, one thing is cool that Donnie V does a song with him on it, you know, obviously recorded in two separate places, but nonetheless, it's Donnie V and Chips Enough on a song together, and it's a damn good one. I feel like Chips kind of found his place as the leader of Enough's Enough, you know, he's kind of been building up to it, but I think on this album, the songs, he just seems more comfortable, you know, like he belongs being the front man of this band, but on the other hand, then you got the Donnie V song to remind you how good, you know, it really could be when they work together. Yeah. And then the other thing that kind of bummed me about it is that the guitar player, Tori, who's been in the band for years, and man, you know, it behold to me to talk shit about Enough's Enough, and I never would want to, but this kind of bothered me a little bit that, you know, tori has been in the band for a long time now, you know, and he's oh. a hell of a guitar player and a hell of a songwriter. And yet, for some reason, not one time does Tori appear on this new album. You know, and I yeah, get it. He's not, you know, Jakey Lee kind of name, but, you know, he's an awesome guitar player. He's a, been a, an amazing contributor to Enough's Enough for a long time. Why not, you know, I don't, I don't get that. I'm not sure why. And I think I heard that Daniel Hill doesn't play on it either. He plays on some of it. Oh, okay, well, yeah, no, Dan, got, Danny Hill plays on some, but nothing for Tori on the new Enough's Enough album, which just, it's kind yeah. of a bummer. And to, you know, and far be it for me to to bash Chip, but at the same time, I don't get Chip sometimes. It's like what's well, the thing where Tori's, you know, and like there's a lot of no, Enough's Enough fans that be, might be like, oh, he'll never be Monaco or whatever. He'll never be Derek. Fine, that's fine. He'll never be because he's a different person. But at the same time. That dude is stuck by Chip through a lot of rough times, man. Yeah. And like you know, it's like the the guy deserves to get to be on the album. And you know, we've gotten to know Tori a little bit over the years. He helped us get Chip on the show, so props to him for that. But like, it just irritates me that Chip wouldn't let the guy play on the record because he's got something to contribute. And if you if you haven't heard the new Black Seven, Tori's other band, that's worth checking out too. But it's just like I don't know. I just. I don't get chipped sometimes. I think some of his decisions are made hastily, you know. Yeah, I don't understand that one either. Nonetheless, the album's pretty damn good. Like I said, there's there's a handful of really, really good songs on here. The one with Donnie V is pretty kick-ass. And, you know, overall, I'd give it, out of five, I'd probably give it three and a half, I'd say. That's not bad. That's pretty positive. Yeah. I don't know. To this day, I mean, I, I'm, st I'm always going to be like, have Tori get t get Donnie in the band and just do a real record. Well, like, I mean, that's my the, the band he's got now, which again, you know, if if it was up to me, if I was in some sort of 
position of power, you know, where I say, all right, here's what's going to happen with this band. You know, I'm about to sign you this label. We're going to make albums. We're going to pay you a lot of money, but you're going to do what you're damn told. Donnie V's back in the band. Chip, you're working with him writing songs. Tori, you're in there writing songs with him too. And Danny on drums, I mean, you already got the band. Chip has got the band. And the only thing yeah. missing is Donnie, you know? And I agree. They're always, know, they're always going to be stronger together. And it's always fun, I think, to be able to pull in, you know, like Ace really does it on his Origins albums, pull in special guests to sing songs and do different things on the album. That's always a lot of fun, and it's cool to associate with other musicians that you respect and stuff. But, man, you know, there's something for a band coming together. And I know a lot of these songs are the songwriting credits. Tori's got a few on this album, you know, and as along with, along with Danny. And, uh, you know, so they had a hand in in creating the songs so i don't know there's something about a band that's together they write the songs together they go in the studio together they go out and tour together you know that's a that's something special there you know so i don't know damn it chip you've got a great band don't let them go to waste yeah i mean that the the the, regardless of your and my fandom the 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 appeal is limited on a on a mass scale so it's like they should probably make smarter decisions, in my opinion, right now. Yeah, I think so, too. So, uh, you want to talk about Overkill? Uh, yeah, I'm always good to talk about Overkill. So, I thought this was cool. Uh, Overkill drummer Jason Bittner's confirmed to BODS Mayhem Hour in a new interview that the band is hard at work on a new studio album. It says, technically, we were supposed to already be done with it by now if the world hadn't changed back in March. Um, But now, due to the fact that we're not pushing for a release that quickly, it's given us a little bit of time to hone the songs a little better and spend some more time and whatnot. So there's about seven songs out of 11 demos that they have. I don't know about you, but if there's anything during this ridiculous time that we're going through, um, I would love a new Overkill record because they are the most consistent thrash band on the planet. Shit, yeah. And you know what? The the headline of this article here is no surprise that overkill is hard at work on a new album because that's the way overkill is i mean if they're not hard at work on tour they're hard at work on a new album and that's just the way they are that's the way they operate they're constantly putting out new albums but the thing is is the albums they come out with are really good you know they're some of the best stuff i mean overkill's got a long career and a discography just loaded full of great thrash metal albums over the years and to be putting out some of their peak performance material nowadays is pretty cool. You know, there's a, just a handful of bands out there that are doing that right now, but Overkill, man, ain't nobody more consistent than them. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I th- and I think they're kind of like the thrash version of Striper, where I think they're putting out some of their strongest material lately compared to the old stuff. So, like, you know, like the Grinding Wheel, Wings of War, White Devil Armory. Yeah. I mean, I, all those records are fucking great. Man, how about that? 2021 Overkill and Striper Tour. Oh, I would fucking buy that ticket for that in a heartbeat. You're damn right. That'd be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so a great awesome. tour. Yeah, it would. Perfect. I love it. All right. What else we got in the news? Let's see. Oh, I'm a little pissed off at Baco. Why? Because he left me to find this out myself, and I was shocked. So Ron Keel, Vinny Apice, and Rudy Sarzo got together and did a cover of Die Young off of Heaven and Hell by Black Sabbath. I didn't know that. It's freaking awesome. And not only did they do the song, but Ron Keel made a video to go with it. And I watched this unaware. And Baco, he's the guy I count on. He's the guy we all count on to keep us up to date on the Ron Keel news. Hot news. We should be going to him right now. News flash from the hot tub. Baco, what's the latest on Ron Keel? And he would have told us, did you know Ron Keel shaved his head bald? Yes, I did. How long ago did this happen? He did it um, probably two years ago. His wife, Renee, had come down with cancer and was going through chemo, so he did it kind of in solidarity with her. So this, that makes sense then, because in the video, he's in the snow. And I was wondering, where would he be to film this video in a cemetery in the middle of a blizzard, North Dakota, but not this time of year? So that must no. be an old video. But I was shocked. But was you know it like what? a Sabbath tribute record? I don't know if it's from a tribute record. All I know is the video just came up like a couple of days ago, and I saw it and oh. was like, Ron Keel's bald, and he still looks fucking cool as hell. 
Yeah. Ron always looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> Man, pretty soon yep. we're all going to shave our heads bald. Everybody keeps doing it. I'll I'll definitely check that out. I love that song though. Yeah, and it's badass, man. Really cool. Ron Keel is a fucking awesome vocalist, man. That dude just wails, and you know he's doing some old school Dio vocals on this song, just nailing it. And then the video is badass too. That's not an easy song to sing for sure. Hell no. That's but he great. He nailed it in his own way. It was great. So I'll tell Baco to uh, keep a surprise. When yeah, he's in Baco. The what's up, man? <laughs> Oh, coming to you live from the hot tub. There's nobody there. So I talk. Can we talk about the uh, a black crow story? I know yeah. they're not really our normal thing. Sure, why not? So did I? Don't know. I I listened to the audio book that Steve Gorman, who was the drummer for the Black Crows, put out. Did have you checked it out? No, but ever, I've heard from multiple people that's something I definitely need uh, to do is listen to that because as far as like a or interesting rock and roll story, it doesn't get much crazier than that. Yeah. I'm told. So, like, people that listen to this show, <clears throat> they like that we can pull the behind-the-scenes stories out and everything, get kind of to the nitty-gritty on stuff. Steve Gorman's book, I can't remember the name of it right now, but um, check this thing out because he does not pull any punches. It's like one of the most brutal, honest rock bios I've ever read. And uh, oh, it's called Hard to Handle the Life and Death of the Black Crows. So, um so in the book and like there's a there, this is an update story that I sent you but <clears throat> in the book like so you remember that I don't know if you remember that like remember there in the 90s there was a time where Jimmy Page was kind of guesting with them on tour yeah Jimmy Crow and, or uh, Jimmy Page and the Black Crows they did a live album together right so like he Jimmy Page was very invested in the band loved all their music and went out on tour with them and they had great shows and everything well in the book this is like the most ridiculous story, but Rich Robinson, the guitar player, um, who's kind of the boss of the band. It was Rich and Chris, the brothers Robinson, that yeah. were kind of they kind of were the leaders of the band. And in the book, Steve Gorman claims that um, after that tour, Jimmy Page was tr- basically trying to work with them on doing a record together, oh, where he nice. would he would help write and produce and everything. And in the book, Steve Gorman claims that Rich Robinson, like Jimmy contacted Rich Robinson, and Rich Robinson goes, yeah, well, we've got a lot of songs already for this album, but thanks anyway. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he turned down Jimmy Page being a part of their record. And, and in the book, just save those songs for another time, maybe, or something? I don't know, but in the book, Steve Gorman recounts wanting to literally go to Rich's house and murder him. Yeah, is that something like... I can't do an album with this guy overshadowing me, you know. It's gonna push me. Yeah. I'm I'm already not the star because my brother is the the lead, the front man of this band. This is gonna push me even further down the totem pole, and I'm supposed to be the guy in charge here. Man, yeah, and that's pretty soon. I'm gonna have to hang out with Steve Gorman. Well, and I think that's where Steve was coming from in the book. But apparently, somebody interviewed Rich Robinson recently. And Rich straight up denied it. He goes, no, there's no way. If, if if Jimmy Page wanted to do a record with us, I absolutely would have done it. But Steve Gorman came back with, well, if I had said no to that, I probably wouldn't want to want to own up to it either. Yeah, I, just, I suppose not. <laughs> I don't remember that. But like, yeah, like Jimmy Page, you know, came to him later and was like, oh, I was really hoping we could work something out. And and Steve was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, Rich turned me down. And it's like, he's like, what? We could have done a record with Jimmy Page. <laughs> Please, Jimmy Page, let's start a band together. Save me from this wreck. Get me out of here. So, yeah, so it's uh, that. If you haven't read Steve Gorman's book, Hard to Handle, it's definitely worth your time because it's got some amazing stories in it. I got to check that out. You're not the only person I've heard that from. Yeah, it's it's. I'm not even a giant Black Crows fan, but I I listened to it twice. I enjoyed it so much. Right on. But, yeah. Have you heard about this thing Dawkins got coming out? <laughs> that, well, they did out something real recently with like old songs. Yeah, that that's what I'm talking about. The Lost Songs, 1978 to 1981. That's coming out on August 28th. It's it's old old docking stuff that was never released, but it looks like George Lynch is on some of it. And I gotta imagine if some of these songs are the German tunes, like around that era, you got Don Bach and Solo then, right? You got to think that, yeah, that's what I think. Because if you think like the late seventies, that would have been Don Dockin before it was actually 
the doc and that you come to know and love in the United States, you know, a few years later. Right. So I wonder if Michael Wagner's got his hand in any of that, that stuff. Cause I know he oh, spent, a they spent a lot of time together in that era. Yeah. I got to imagine Michael's probably involved in some way for that. But I'm interested to hear these songs that are like, I don't know, Dawkins kind of one of those bands that it's like White Snake. You know, people didn't know really a whole lot about White Snake unless you were old school until they came to America and got on MTV and then they were superstars. Dawkins, same thing. You know, Don Dawkins had been out there doing stuff for years and even the incarnation of the band that would come to be had been slugging it out for quite a while before they finally got on MTV and started getting some exposure and stuff. So, yeah. you know, there's always like the, the early European versions of some of these bands and Dawkins got some stuff coming out that I don't think anybody's heard before. That's pretty yeah, cool. I definitely want to check it out because there's some really good stuff in, in that from those days. And it's funny you mentioned Dawkins because um, there's a show – called good company with scott bowling that i i do the i produce the audio version of the video show that he does and he did a he did a like a round table thing with brian head belch from corn um morgan rose from seven dust and rich ward from fozzy right on <clears throat> where they're going through their favorite 80s rock records and and brian held brian head welch is one of his picks was dawkins tooth and nail nice and they all just kind of gush over George Lynch and 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 Dawkins, and I, that reminded me when you and me met Brian at the film screening. We we brought up because at the time we were trying to court him to be the guest at Rock and Pod. Yeah, and uh, he had mentioned Dawkins, how George Lynch was an influence on him. So I was like, I told Scott, I'm like, I'm so glad he brought up Dawkins because that kind of verifies what he told us that George Lynch was an influence on him. Yep, that's cool, man. I like that. Yeah. But yeah, I just I Dawkins man, that Dawkins is one of the more underrated eighties bands that there is, in my opinion. And then if I'm not mistaken, I think they also have a new album in the works of actual new music too. Well, I don't know if I'm as excited about that. I mean, have you seen the recent footage of Dawkins playing live? Uh is he injured or something? Well, his his arm is fucked up from surgery because he says he can't play guitar anymore. Not that Don was ever much. I mean, I heard Don was a great guitar player back in the early days, but. Yeah. His vote by his vocals are bad. It's just he's uh his voice is shot. Um, did you hear this news about Ellefson? Uh no. Uh uh-uh. uh. So Ellefson, which is basically the partnership between David Ellefson and Tom Hazard, yeah. they've decided to do this thing. It's a covers L P called No Cover. And it's a it's a whole covers record with different guest stars on it and I went ahead and donated to the GoFundMe on this because I want to help see it happen just because I love those guys. But there's a hell of a list of guests on this thing. Um, so, like, some of the guests are Bumblefoot, Charlie Benante, Eddie Ojeda, Dave Lombardo, Brandon Yegley from Crobot, Dirk from Megadeth, Frank Hannon and Troy from Tesla, Mark Slaughter, Jason McMaster, uh, Chuck Beeler from Megadeth, Gus G, Doro Pesh, I, Todd Kearns. A ton of Al Al Jorgensen from Ministry. You know, I I hear stuff like this, and I think, you know, Bob Kulik invented all this. He was the guy that made the tribute albums where the artists didn't even have to be in the same room. You know, you'd have the core band would record the songs, and then you'd send them to the lead guitarist that you're having on here or the bass player to record over or the singer then lay the vocals on, and then they send it all back to Bob, and he puts it all together. Those guys in those old tribute albums, they're not all in the same studio together. That's the way it was back then, and now Mm -hmm. it seems like that's the way everything is. Yeah, and yeah, Bob deserves credit for that format for sure. Because that was that was a big thing in the '90s, and now it seems like it's coming back around. Yeah, he pre- he but predicted like, it. Some of the there's a few tracks on here that really piqued my interest. Like the first track is "Free Will Burning" by Judas Priest with Jason McMaster, Gus G, Andy James, and Dave McLean. I'm excited to hear that. That Jason McMaster from Dangerous Toys. Yep. Nice. Also, uh, "Tear It Loose" by Twisted Sister with Eddie Ojeda on it. Right on. Um, Love Me Like a Reptile, the Motorhead song with Shit. Doro Pesh singing. Oh, fuck yeah, man. Oh, wow. man, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. Riff Raff by ACDC with Jason McMaster and Dave Lombardo on drums. Right on. So, and then they, they act, and there's several, there's Say What You Will by Fastway with Troy Lucetta and Mark Slaughter singing. 
Nice. And then uh, they have released one single. They released it, Wasted by Def Leppard, that has Frank Hannon, Jacob Button, Dave McLean, and Bumblefoot. And I gotta say, our buddy Tom Hazart sings lead vocals on this dude, and he fucking slays on it. Sweet. He sounds amazing, and I gotta. Get, I mean, I've heard Tom sing with the Ellison Project, but he's his vocals on this are fucking amazing. That's awesome. I gotta check yeah. that out. I might give myself I, a little pre-order action on that myself. Yeah, it's 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 gonna be really cool. I mean, it, it looked and like the the cover art they put they basically took the on through the night with the from Def Leppard with the the semi truck and the guitar coming out on top. Uh-huh. You remember that yeah, cover? Of course. And then it's got so it's got Ellison across the grill, and they took the uh, headstock from Dave's Jackson bass and put it over the the top of the truck. Right on, that's <laughs> so awesome. Pretty, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm super excited to uh, to hear the whole thing. Right on, that's cool. I like it. Yeah. Um, I've only got one more that I thought of for this week. Okay. Have you heard the new Marilyn Manson song? I have not. It's a tune called We Are Chaos. It's got a video with it. Do not eat mushrooms and watch this video. <laughs> I didn't do that, and boy, am I lucky. That video is insane. You'll you'll watch it and be glad you didn't, or you'll want to go get some and watch it again, one of the two. But you know what? It's not bad. I kind of like it. you know. And it's been a little while since I've heard a Marilyn Manson song that I really, really like. You know, It's been, it's been a while. Yeah, but, the last couple of records he's done have not really done much for me, so I'm, I'm interested here. I'm not going to watch it tonight because I'm eating mushrooms right now. But, yeah. <laughs> Do not watch it. <laughs> but no, it's pretty cool. I had to check it out because, you know, I like Marilyn Manson. I like a lot of the old stuff, but I haven't heard nothing in a while I like. But this is pretty cool. And this is him working with Shooter Jennings, so it's like, oh, I don't know. It's got some guitar in it, that's for sure. That should be interesting. But it's kind of a mellow a little bit heavy. I don't know. It's different for sure. But at first I was like, yeah. And I listened to it one more time. I was like, yeah, I feel it. This is pretty badass. I've so, heard good things about it. I'm I've actually, had I'm actually looking forward to a Marilyn Manson album this year now. So it's been a while since I could say that. I've had several people I know posting up raves about it on Facebook. So yeah, I'll check it out. Right on. All right. You got anything else or is that it? Is that the news? Well, this is kind of, uh, this is the last one I'll do. Um, this is funny. Metallica's Lars Ulrich has no regrets about the Saint Anger drum sound. He says, "I stand behind it a hundred percent." Wow! Even so, in retrospect, I don't know so, about that. Yeah, so Lars Ulrich is eating mushrooms. That's kind of like if you blow <laughs> off Jimmy Page, and then years later somebody asks you about it, you go, "No, I don't remember that. That's that's not how that went." Lars is the opposite. He's like, "Yep, I did it." And it was awesome. You get you just be like, you know what? We fucked up that album, but we were experimenting and oh well, what are you gonna do? You know? Yeah. Maybe see, and then that would open the door to saying, Hey, let's re record some of those songs the way they're supposed to be. I don't know, but like you know, there was an interview with Bob Rock like a week or two ago where he was defending it too. Well, and he and was saying like, that's what he was saying was that you know they were looking back on some of their earlier stuff and some of the sounds, some of the ways that they would capture the sound. And one of the things was what they'd done with the drums. And once it was set up and he got it, he was like, "Yeah, this reminds me of something, you know, some kind of throwback." And then they just went with it, and nobody said nothing. So that's just the way it ended up. Well, in like you know, anybody who's been in a band will know. Like basically, the 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 Saint Anger drum sound, it's a snare that's not clipped in. So like this, like a snare drum has these little thin metal like metal coils that go underneath a snare drum. Right. And when you clip it in and lock it, that's where you get the pop. But if you don't clip it in, it sounds like a fucking garbage can being hit. And so that was the whole way the whole thing came about was Lars left it left it unclipped and started hitting it. And they go, that's the sound. We want to go with that. And it's like, wow. And they, But once it was like decided, they just basically stubbornly continued with that sound. But like, I don't know, man, I. And I, I think he just know, he forgot to clip it in, and nobody noticed until the album was halfway done. And then they're like, "Oh shit, this hasn't been clipped on the whole time." Lars is like, "Oh man, I thought I had it. I thought I had it clipped on uh-huh. all the way. What do we do now? You know, we can't start over. Well, I'll leave it. Leave the sucker unclipped. We only got three songs to go." 
No, they, they even in this interview, he says that that, that was the sound they wanted. They liked it. Wow. And I don't know, man. It's just so it's so bizarre that Bob Rock, who's known for such big sounding fucking records like Doctor Feel Good and the Black Album, is like, yeah, that's the sound we want. It's it just tells me that I think Metallica was bored and they were like, fuck it, let's just do something different. So the mid two thousands were a strange time. If you remember it, you weren't really there. Yeah, but I mean, they, you know, and like the, a lot of people bash the Some Kind of Monster documentary, and for good reason, it's got some really cringeworthy moments, but if you watch it just from a musical standpoint, it's a band that got too big so fast where, and they had run out of ideas, because they toured themselves into the ground before that record. So basically, if you filmed a documentary on the making of The Elder, you'd end up with the same thing. Pretty much, because it's a band that's out of ideas, struggling to come up with ideas. Ah, that's tough, man. And what you get is St. Anger, the worst Metallica album of them all. Hands well, next down. to Lulu. No question about it. But yeah. But they put out Hardwire, and that helps make up for it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's not just the news. Those are the facts. Right. As we know them. All right, well, it was fun to get back and do New Noise. I mean, we've been doing Kiss so long. I mean, shit, half the episode was Kiss anyway, but that's just that's just <laughs> us. We can't help ourselves, you know. You might love us for it. You might hate, hate us for it, but know that we just can't help ourselves. So that's us, the Decibel Geek Podcast, bringing you the news that matters. And so as we end this today, as promised, Brand new music from the Rock and Roll Residency. Yeah, you know him as Gene Simmons Band. Yeah, you know him as the Ace Frehley Band. But if you're from here in Nashville, like Chris and I are, you know that they're the Rock and Roll Residency. Do you have a preference? I love the whole thing. It's an EP. It's available out there now. Chris is going to put the links in the show notes so you guys can check it out. And you definitely want to support these guys. But I like it all. You got a preference on a song? I love them all too, man. I, I guess maybe go with the instrumental track that's kind of the single right now. I think he's playing guitar. 